the world can witness the celebrations but only one man knows the struggles the man who has lived through them let's hear the uncensored story of kp's journey from a village to london and then back to the villages to transform them into the symbol of modern urban india So to start with and just for the record if you could tell us your name your designation and the name of the organization that you represent my name is kp singh i am the chairman emeritus of a company called dlf limited superb now sir we would love to hear your entire journey if you could tell us your story your life story starting from childhood the kind of family you were born into your early years your education how you got into perhaps your first job how you got into business and how you got into dlf and how you started growing into this business and how this business has grown if you could just tell us your life story from birth till date thank you i would is rather a complex answer to your question Uh, I started actually from a small village. His name was Khandera in in Uttar Pradesh, and I went initially to a very small village school. Then later on migrated to a town called Pulanshir, where I got admitted into a madrasa. My family were landlords but my father had moved on to do his legal education later on became a lawyer and was settled in bulanshir with very early meager resources so my initial uh, school was a madrasa but soon in few months time i ran away from madrasa because they were not suiting me and instead i joined an english medium speaking school in bulanshir where i studied past my higher secondary what you call it now and moved on to a uh, merit college to do my graduation in science which i did but during this period i was in merit college and the fact that my father himself was a very good tennis player he groomed me into tennis and my life in merit college became playing tennis for the college and as luck would have it my uncle was then posted in the army in the then viceroy of india called lord wavell and he was looking after the horses the stables so it used to give me a chance to uh, occasionally go in a train from merit to delhi and then stay with him this happened for several years almost till my education but as i moved on i became fond of horses there because my uncle was responsible for the upkeep of the entire horse which were about 100 horses there top class with the boys at that time so from there my life started took a different journey i will call it accidents of life i would happen but what i could do i used to sneak out from his back door and see the wonderful horses not realize think that i am not supposed to be in that area because as, as a viceroy of india highly controlled they always maybe more than 100 british soldiers and all kind of thing but i used to see so one day i sneaked on and without realizing i was just seeing the horse and suddenly the viceroy lord we will came in the morning drive they used to ride around and suddenly the horse came 
and my uncle's job was to dismount him. So as luck would have it, he's dismounted right in front of me, so it happened. And I was a, a scraggly-looking character with uh, completely wearing a little pajama and that kind of thing, like, you know, completely unlike the army. So he got down his, and he said, who are you? How the hell are you in this, uh, in this uh, um, security zone? I did not know how to speak English, frankly. I didn't understand him. My uncle tried to interpret it for me and told me what. And then he asked me, he mentioned, in fact, he was about to lose his job that day because he cannot allow a civilian in a highly protected zone. But instead, he said, sir, forgive me. He's my nephew. He just came in inside. So then Lord Weaver started telling me, young man, do you like horses? Now he was, the guy was talking in English. I could not understand English. So my uncle told him, say, no, yes. So I said, yes, without understanding what he, what he was saying. So then he said, told his brigadier who was following him, I remember still name Brigadier Stewart. I said, Brigadier Stewart, come here. Make him a best horseman. You want to be a horseman? Yes. So make him a best horseman. And then he rode, rode away. That was my start of my life. And I would call it accidents of life. So then from Merit, I used to come regularly by train, almost two, three times a month. And these guys lined up with such a training for me because that was the order of the Viceroy. And the training was all making you a tough and rough, make you fall from the horses, you can jump up again. It's like two years. Eventually, I became a very good horseman. And I started playing polo as a college kid. Thereafter, another twist came in my life. And the twist was that a friend of mine got admission into aeronautical engineering in England. And those days, it was considered to be a great prestige for, a, for, for the family to send a kid to abroad for training, unheard of, frankly, at that time. So he got me also, without talking to me, he got me admission into the same college in commentary, aeronautical engineering. I had no aptitude for engineering, completely. So I just, because it was here, my father-in-law took loan, because he was not that rich at that time. And he, just for him, it was a great thing that his son is going for to England for that to aeronautical engineering. So I went there. Then another twist happened in my life that when I landed up in there, my actual mind was not engineering. And one day, while the engineering, they tell you, open the engine, take the bolts out, put into it, then re reassemble. And they found that there were about 20 nuts and bolts left over in the engine. So that day, the instructor told me, God forbid, which aeroplane you will be engineer with, that they're bound to have a <laughs> crash. So my life was then centered around more with horses, tennis. And I got involved with, because I was a good horseman, and I was a good tennis player too. So I got involved with the aristocracy there. Fortunately, I got involved in a crowd which spotted me and encouraged me. So I was mostly spending my time playing polo, horses, less time on engineering. Till I met a guy called Brigadier Vidalia, now his daddy was General Vidalia. He had a very major influence in my life. He was the first military advisor to the Indian High Commission. So he asked me, because he was, he was a great polo player himself. So he used to see me playing polo. So one day he asked me, come here, young man. Who are you? So I told him, what, what are you doing here? I said, Sir, I'm doing aeronautical engineering. So he said, look, come on and have a cup of tea with me. He gave me the address of his place. I went there. Very decent man. He's a young man. 
whatever little I know, you are not cut out for engineering. You are playing a great polo game here. You are being invited to join different teams because if you play good polo there, the bigger aristocratic club that invite you to play here. Play. So actually, I was doing that only. So he said, my suggestion is that you should apply for the Indian Army. And this is, mind you, we're talking 47, just about 47, 48. With us. Apply for the Indian Army and I will see, I'll approach the headquarters in India to get you special permission to be interviewed by the Sanders uh, Selection Board where the British officers are selected. That's what exactly happened. So when it happened to ask me, I remember it was, I was reluctant, but my only thing was if I can get uh, free passage to go somewhere, I can play polo, I can go on the horses. So I went with a very carefree mind. And there were five days interview with about 40 uh, other British people. I was with them. They make you all kinds of things they do, like they do in India, same way, in interviews. So then I was just not bothered. With, basically, I was not wanting to c come back to India, frankly. I started enjoying that life. Polo, parties, great life, aristocracy. So then I got a call from his office one day. The brigadier wanted to see you, so I went there. So he said, young man, you have been selected. And now I suggest, there's a month of October, November, October now, so I suggest you should accept the assignment, go back to India, you will make a great career. So I told him, I said, no, because I'm not keen. So why, why no? He said, because first day I said, I have no money to go get my passage back to India. So he said, well, I'll take up with the government. Let's see. Secondly, the thing is, I have already plans with my friends to go to St. Maurice for skiing and all kinds of things. So I can't do join academy in, on 1st January, it's late. So would you believe he was so much, he got permission for me to join academy two months late, unheard of in the army, paid my, my passage, why? Because apparently I stood first in the interview. So when I went there in the, uh, in the academy, I was identified as a guy coming from London and they rag you like hell completely. So within two days time, I was ragged so much that my hair cut and all kinds of things. I said, where the hell have I come? So I made a hasty plan to come back to, go back to, uh, to, to England again. Till another twist happened in my life. Look at the amount of twist. My letter, of saying that I'm going because I was an identified person having come two months late. Nobody has ever happened in an academy. So the battalion commander called Colonel Baljeet Singh called me. And it was a hell of a tough job. I was told that you can't be before the colonel. You were very upright. I was told not to sit. I kept standing. He said, no, sit down, gentlemen. You great. You sit. He made me comfortable. He said, you want to run away? I said, no, sir. He said, look, he took from draws the letter. So he said, look, I'm sorry we censor everything you do here because you are a soft target. This was the letter you had written. So then I could not say. I said, yes, sir, I was running away. He said, why are you running away? I said, I don't like the life. I made a mistake. He said, no, if you run away like this, you were bound to be arrested at the Dehradun airport because there now your hairs have been cut and all. There are only one train goes in the evening to Delhi. Military police is there and they always look for people who are running away. So they will identify you. And once you are arrested, your career is finished. Minimum six months you'll be in the jail also, very tough regulation. So if you want to run away, 
I'll help you to run away. Look at the, what Brigadier tells me. I'll help you to run away. So he means he won me over. I said, how, sir? He said, I'll drive you in my own car, car and I will take you to a place called Hardwar, which is about 40 miles ahead of Dehradun. There's no military police there because after the train leaves Dehradun, there is no military police. I'll drive you. I'll put you in the, um, in, on, on the station. Then you di disappear in history wherever you want to go. But think it over. In this letter, you have written uh, to a friend of yours that you are running away in three, four days' time. So two, three times, think, come back to me. I'll be happy. But can I ask you one question? You see, he won me over so completely. I said, sir, yes, sure. He said, what will you do after you go to England and say you complete your graduation in this engineering course? So I said, sir, I will hopefully get a job there. Because aeronautical engineering jobs at that time in India were not too many. Because aviation was not developed. We are talking 47, 48. So I said, I'll get a job. So he said, well, OK. If you get a job, then you'll be a little pip squeak. He, still, I remember those words. Can you imagine? It's my, he used me, you'll be a little pip squeak in England, but you will look luxuriously, you live well. And that will be, and as that generally people in England do. But on the contrary, if you come back, what would you do? So I said, I, on the contrary, if I get a job, sure, I'd like to come back to India. He said, but look, he knew the whole family history of mine, my uncles and all. They were great, one of them had a military cross, so they were decorated soldiers. So he said, I know these, you have your two uncle decorated soldiers and all. You are from this place. Yes, yes, sir. He said, but one thing is, you'll always be known that you are a bhagora. So frankly, I didn't understand the word bhagora. So I asked him, I said, sir, what, please say again, bhagora is what, 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 does, what do you mean by bhagora? He said, well, it means only, is a colloquial word. It means the coward who ran away. He handled me so perfectly. So I said, sir, I'm not covered. He said, I'm not saying. They will say. Because you happen to be a family of military people. I'm not saying, but they may say that you are, because you ran away. So, so you seem to be very, very sort of concerned the way you tell. I said, yes, sir, I'm concerned. I'm not a Bukhara. He said, then why don't you prove yourself? You, you got only four, three uh, uh, months left over in this term. Have your training and complete it. If you want to run away, then go when there's a vacation. Then people will not know. Would you believe this was a big twist in my life? I decided, I said, no, sir, I would not run away. I will go back I'll training. I worked hard. Then this, look at the destiny are in a fate. The same brigadier, Badalia from England, he became major general and came as commandant of the academy. And in the passing out parade, I got the sword of honor. Sword of honor considered the best cadet. He handled me. Look at the destiny. Thereafter, I was attached with him for nine years. I was posted with the staff officer here and there. So, so in the, after nine kind of years when I was in the army, Meanwhile, what had happened was, I got married to a real estate uh, uh, family. And I, my father-in-law's name, uh, Raghavendra Singh, his daughter. And we, she was young, she was 19 years old when I got married, and she was married. So we grew up together. We had a massive compatibility. My life took a different turn then. 
And then he prevailed upon me to leave the army and join our business because they did not have any son. They had two daughters, two daughters only. So that is why another twist. I decided to resign from the army. With difficulty, I could get my resignation accepted because those days they were not allowing a resignation to be accepted. Then 61, I joined my family business. Initially, I was, I had no, no idea of business at all. So my first job was breeding horses by the name of a stud farm called Kutub Stud. Very famous stud farm at that time. General Badalia came, he also retired. He and myself as partners together. We were breeding horses for three, four years. And meanwhile, what happened was, our family, this is my father, decided to invest and set up a company manufacturing precision electric motors with Americans as partners, 50% partner by Americans, 50% I had no clues. And so, but because I was who I was, and thereafter I went to America for training. The, I met a great per person in my life. I would call him uh, the biggest mentor to me, was a person called George Hoddy. He was the chairman of the, uh, and founder of that company, and he took me as his own son in a way. And then several months intensive training to, to train me as a businessman, and particularly in the business of manufacturing electric motors. So my career started and the shift from there. And thereafter, of course, I was there. Meanwhile, as luck would have it, that what uh, my father-in-law's company name was DLF. He was a very, uh, very successful businessman, but from Partition time, 76, to only 1958. Because at that time, most of the good colonies here, 21 colonies in Delhi, Great War, Great Class 1, 2, Horse Class, all they're built by DLF. But then in 58, the government decided to nationalize this business. Means private sector cannot do urban land development. They took decision which was most unfortunate or wrong, but they perhaps had honorable intention to see that by this decision, more housing supply will come, the, the prices of rentals will come down, there will be planned development, farmers will get more money, and there will be no corruption. Exactly opposite happened, because the demand was so huge. One sector could not do. So wherever people found land, vacant land, they put houses. That's how you had mushroom, mushroom growth of, of unauthorized development and, and, and the slums. This is one uh, decision wrong of the then government in 58 had knocked the hell out of urbanization in India. Even today, one sector of economy, we are not proud. So this was closed. In 1975, when business was totally closed, my family prevailed upon me that you come and try and revive this business. So I said, how the hell do I revive it? A, I don't know real estate. Two, the fact is business has been nationalized. So you have to lobby with the government to convince them that was the wrong decision, open this business again. As you know how difficult it is. Can you have a government to reverse the decision? Second, banks were forbidden to loan for urban land development. And the company was completely closed. For 20 years, they did not do any business. Uh, uh, when nationalized, so DLF opted out. So here is a company, totally uh, no money, no organization. Law is against you. Banks can't give them. How, the, how do you go about? And when you talk a city, thousands of acres, unheard of anywhere even today. Because normally the holding of land here in, 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 in India, all, all, all over India, is through families who have got four or five acres, maybe 10 acres. And the, the laws are such that four or five acres, but you have, in any case, you can't have more than 17 acres because of the 
of, of the uh, uh, agriculture sealing act but normally let's say average was about five six acres in in this area but that two feudal families who are such that the although the law gives you equal to girls and boys but they will always like the money to go to boys this was the same thing so i encountered that i said how the hell am i going to get this land make it a contiguous block of thousand of your country were unheard of. But something happened when my sister-in-law, who was very dear to me, and my, my late wife said, we have confidence in you, because they were very concerned that I must be, because they were the two shareholders of the company. He said, no, we know if you jump into the sea, if you don't come back, we will not, we will not do mourning. But I know very well, you'll fight like hell to come back. We know your character, do it. So frankly, this pushed me into making an impossible job into possible. If history is written today, which I've written in the background paper, you'll find. So I said, OK, I'll take the challenge. My father-in-law was alive at that time. He is retired, a very experienced person. He advised me not to do it, frankly, because look, with my background, polo, polo and all this horse, uh, uh, polo and social life like this thing doesn't go with the way my life is going to turn or way the requirement means interacting with farmers, sitting with them, years and years, eating with them, making part of their belief, then lobbying with the government to change archaic laws. All that to do where? You can't have a professional team because they're not experienced. So I had to lead myself and my only few very low-key revenue officers. So frankly, he said, look, chum, young man, I don't think you'll be able to do it. My feeling is stick to manufacturing. You're doing uh, because this is a very different. So it hit me, frankly. I'm one of those persons, uh, that's why my autobiography is whatever the odds. I, I, I perform best when I'm under pressure. So I said, no, sir, I will take the challenge. I will do personally myself. So thereafter, my book described, it is USAID carried a big study, is unheard of anywhere in the world, even today, that a private sector, you can or you can make land contiguous by purchasing only an average of about five, six acres into say four, 5,000 acres patch to make a city. You can't make a city in, in 200 acres. You do. And that too, how? Imagine what happened. That too payable on able basis or land taken on credit because I became member of the farmer's family. For nearly 15 years, I devoted my time. There was hardly a function in the family. I did not end the marriages, this thing, and going around to, to get there and accept me as member of the family. So I solved their problem. It was a very comical thing. Once a farmer was very important to me. See, normally these are all, I hear some jarts in this area. So I'm from the rural background, so I can talk the same language. So there's so much confidence. It came around to this thing one day, the guy tells me, ah, KB sahab, baaki to theek hai. Chori badi ho gai. Ek ladka dhundar, wo bulanshar mein dekha hai ka. Ab humar saath chalo dekhenge. So I went there myself, my place. And seeing a groom for their daughter. But that was the life. That's what made me different. So, I got eventually that much trust that most farmers gave their land on credit to me. It was when I succeed, pay, pay. Otherwise, impossible. How do you get money? How do you buy it? And history now today, that's how Gurgaon Township has come around. And meanwhile, at the same time, I had to lobby with the chief ministers, the central government, with it, all by myself. So in turn, what happened was my Almost 20 years of my life were devoted 
in something totally different to what I was earlier doing. Earlier I was, I, would, I used to enjoy a good life, as I said, playing polo, meeting this thing, doing light thing, but this was hard, hard work. And on and on, on and on. So, and some chief minister, was, most chief minister I couldn't get along very well, except one Bansilal, who was hell-bent on arresting me. In real estate opened up in, in, in Haryana, and the story thereafter is, the township is complete, now done. Then my son, who, who was a uh, graduate from MIT, just about the time came, and ex unfortunately I had an accident, my wife had, in a helicopter, in the beginning of 2001, actually, and uh, so hell blows. We were taken to New York, and thereafter I became almost solely involved in saving her because she had so many surgeries, so many issues. And Raji, my son, came, although inexperienced at that time, but he was a good learner. So he started looking after. But the most important phase of real estate was done already by me, which means assemble the land into a compact box, get it zoned properly, get all amendment to archaic laws, town planning, and get the laws reversed. All this had been done by me in 20 years. Thereafter, what happens is you only make good buildings. And my son is very good in this one. He has got in his thing, the, you will see the buildings which he has done now, they are better than the best. He is, and, and actually, the four, his daughter, daughter is also involved into this thing. I will call the fourth generation. Because DLF is the only press, maybe, I, at least I don't know any other company. It started in 76, no, sorry, I started 46, I beg your pardon. It has been in 76 years fourth generation now, and with an impeccable uh, brand uh, thing, because we've always believed, right from that time we learned, our moral ethical values will be always superior, higher than greed of making money. So therefore, we became a highly compliant company. Like of which perhaps, I don't know, real estate doesn't exist. So this, in short, this is my life now. Superb. So I'm going to prop a few parts so that there is little bit of a gap between, you know, your father-in-law asking you to take over the business. And when did you think of building the township? So that part I haven't got. My father-in-law dissuaded me because he felt. Dissuaded from what? From getting into reviving DLF into and making a township. Yeah. So the part I haven't got is where you are taking on the challenges or you were being offered the challenges of reviving DLF, and then how did you get the idea of starting the township? No, because that was DLF's business. See, DLF, uh, after um, uh, the partition of India, my father-in-law, he was a great visionary. So what he did was, he was in a government job, he left the job in 45 or 46, well knowing partition of India is happening. So he formed a company in 1946 with only a few people around him. And he started at that time to develop what they call colonies or mini townships here in Delhi to provide accommodation to those refugees coming from Pakistan, essentially. And he succeeded because he got those things. And frankly, the farmers community here also at that time were also he, because he used to do the same, he used to move himself with farmers. And he was a very uh, compliant person. He earned the trust of people for about 20 years. So in, in 20 years, like 47 to 58, I don't know, but, uh, in this period, DLF had made 21 colonies. Model town, and, uh, this, so all kinds of, but, but most successful colonies. But they were only 100, 200 acres. Like you would say GK1. I don't GK1 is maybe 200 acres. I know GK2 is about 215 acres, totally separate. 
but you are talking several thousand acres to make a city. Ah, so if you can just say that. Well, see, thing is, some people have in them to dream big. I, right from beginning, had one thing in my eyes. And maybe when you start humble, maybe when you are nothing, because the way I could move from humble like, and then to playing polo with the best aristocracy in England, it happened in, in a couple of years. And then I switched on to cavalry. cavalry. Gave me one confidence. And by nature, me and my late wife, she was extremely supportive to me and great in building relationships. We used to build relationships with whomever we meet, friends. So actually in that process, what happened was, when, uh, uh, when with, I, I was pushed into the LF question, what do I do? So fortunately, there was only a 30 acre patch in Gurgaon area, which I've described in my uh, book. I happened to go there, I remember the 10th of May, scorching hot. And all desolate land, which is now housed the thing. So I was sitting there under a kikar tree. Kikar is the scraggly tree. And there, 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 there was a uh, camel going down and up, taking water from, from the well. I was sitting on a village ch ch chapai and under the tree, just sitting, thinking what you're asking me, what should I do? How do I revive DLF? So 30 acres, fortunately, Haryana had not adopted Urban Land Sealing Act. So legally I could do in Haryana, not in Delhi. Fortunately, because Haryana, if the Urban Land Sealing Whichever of you can't do any different. But this state had not adopted this act. So I knew this. And as luck would have it, when I was sitting, <laughs> and as a, a jeep comes around, only about 20, 30 yards away in the, in the road, and just stopped, got, got overheated. So a driver came rushing to say we need some bucket of water to cool down the jeep. And most people here are retired subedar, Havaldar, who are living, and they are jarts and hairs. So I'm from the rural background, I could relate to them. And quite a lot of people were those whose relation had the land in here in Delhi, where DLF made the colonies. For example, Chirag, Delhi, and all these things. So they were all interconnected, they all, all farmers knew DLF. But thereafter, it was a long battle, 10 years to, to gradually go back. But one more event happened, which I must explain to you, happened, which is a turning point with the money. Otherwise, I made no money. But a turning point came up was that in 76, suddenly a new law was enacted here called Urban Land Sealing Act. And Delhi, of course, was uh, covered by the, by that law, which meant that not more than 500 yards of vacant land you can have. Because the rest of the land, if you have, on that day of the law came, becomes surplus and taken over by the government free of cost. Now, in DLF, what was done as a model of business, what Chaudhry Sahib had done was to facilitate a buyer to buy, of course, they were hardly at that time 10 rupees, 15 rupees a yard selling price, even five rupees, they were very, very low price. But even then, that was in they used to ask payment installment for 20 to 25 years, very gradual payments. Until the payment, last payment is received, the title of the land remains in DLF, not them, because they, they will become title holder when. Last payment is received, so it's a 20, 25 years. Hundreds and thousands of plot holders who suddenly land got covered by this law because the title was in our name. So DLF had more than 500 yards 
I mean, hell of a lot more because everybody's land got accumulated in our name. So by law, it became that there's surplus. So there was a hue and cry. People came, they wanted to refund their money. Which money was there? Only two, two and a half crore total, but we had no money. So we tried to see how do I go about getting this uh, money. And there's another event ha happened in my life, which is, which is a turning point, frankly, and to others also. So when the law came, uh, it was a hell of a job here because DLF had not started the, uh, the operation. Suddenly you landed up with a refund of money to those people who... Uh, how do you deal with it? So by nature, I'm one of those persons. I learned with Mr. Hoddy, George Hoddy, when I went to U.S. Micro. I go into detail of everything myself. So I said, let me read this law. It was five pages, ten pages law. It's not very complicated law. But when I read the law, I found there's one area where exemptions could be given. And that stated, if the central government, or the government is satisfied that any provision of this law brings hardship to a common man, then by a notification, government can exempt it. So I caught this point. And because one of my uh, USP is building relations with people. So I had, then I naturally, I had a fortunately very good relationship with the special assistant to the minister, then the chief, then the secretary concerned, um, uh, one Mr. N.J. Kamath, uh, who was uh, uh, the secretary of urban development minister, uh, minister. So I went around and showed to them. They said, well, you have a point. Because I said, this is not my money. This is a common man. Their land is being taken away. What will you do to, all right, we don't give, we, we have no money. Go to court. This is the law. This is a common man they are being deprived. They said, yes, you are right. So I convinced them wrongly. So the first reaction was, now borrow money like hell at any cost, because this will mean the line, land values at that time has shot up to about 50,000 rupees a yard from five rupees. If exemption is given, it's exempt, land is exempted. You could also, but before that, return everybody's money. Borrow, give, return. And then this land is yours, you can make billions. And this turning point is, I said, no, I would not do it because this is against my ethics. No, I'd rather make them millionaires and they will make me in turn. This exactly what happened the moment this came, overnight thousands of people became millionaires. Farmers, those whose relations about the plot, they became millionaires. So word of mouth spread so much that we were inundated, DLF, when we had just started 30 acres. So much demand, people came with money. So we had a deposit scheme. So much money came in, in the two banks, New Bank of India and Punjab Nishman, that what we were, we were short of money became surplus. So one moral of the story, for a businessman, ethics and morality should always be over and above the greed for making money by shortcut. If you follow this, market pays you. I followed it. I would say this is the success of DLF. If I had not done, perhaps we would have had no money. But within a matter of, can you imagine, within a matter of two, three years, we have surplus money. Then we could buy more land, more land, more aggressive, more aggressive. So some events happened like this. And so why I thought of township, as I explained to you, was my desire to convert my vision. Why my vision? Some people are born with vision, some people are not visionary. I had one thing always. How can I become better, bigger? There was like an obsession. Anything you do, you want to be bigger. Anything you want to do, bigger. So this was my thing. No, this, why can't I create a city here? But then God helped me. Connections helped me. Money came, government laws got changed. And then I went through. And thereafter, the history of DLF, 
that how much money is poured in, what a grand name. And as I said, fortunately, then my son came into the business. And this thing. so this is the, I will, I will attribute more to my vision. And I do believe, I tell everyone, every child must have a vision. It's parents' duty to create that fire in him or in, in the girl, who had maybe a child, that they have to be driven to be, become something in life. It happened with me naturally. I don't know why it, how it happened. But every time I was doing, I was only concerned with how can I be bigger? How can, how can I do it? How can, it is like a, just today I analyze quite a lot how this thing could have happened. Even when my late wife's accident took place, she got a helicopter accident. Then she got cancer in, in America. For almost two years. So I became half a doctor myself. I go in micro detail. And I, she survived 18 years after that, just because I deeply involved, deeply involved. So anything you do in life, if you do with complete knowledge, and you are sincere what you are doing, your ethics and morality as well, God helps you. That is my belief. That's what happened. Very good. Excellent. And after Gurugaon, what? What happened after Gurugaon? See, firstly, Gurugaon is not even 50% built yet. Gurugaon is a large area. And we have got so much land bank that in my sense of judgment, they, anybody can do it. Firstly, it's a success story. You see, when there is a success story, demand goes up. So issue will be, there's no, no land related issues. Now it's all zoned properly. So is ability of our organization to continue making the best building that anybody has seen. And I'm very proud to say my son has that in him, that whatever he does, he will not cut sh shortcut, no. He'll always think of how can I do the best in the world? So he normally sends his team, team of engineers, architects, go and see buildings outside, go and see this thing. So I don't know whether you heard this camellia today. If you, there is a building complex called camellia in phase five. That I will call it better than the best any building I have seen in my life, anywhere in the world. And the market pays for it. So it is a, is a way of life. That's what, frankly, I've done it. And uh, uh, what after Gurgaon? Even to do Gurgaon, uh, mind you, we are not only in Gurgaon, we are in about 20 different cities, but we had one experience after our IPO. We went around, expanded everywhere virtually. But then my son was quick to realize that this business you can't expand like this one. Because it's highly controlled by politicians. Highly controlled, it's become the local people. So therefore, it is not, when if you want to have a clean business, the way DLF does, clean, total. Ethically clean, compliance wise. You cannot do in too many states because this expertise you can combine only to two. So we retracted from areas. I think now we are at almost, I think about 15, 20, uh, cities or states. Uh, I think, yes, we are in, in like Hyderabad in, in Chennai and uh, other important places in Bombay also. I think they are um, do, uh, planning to do something, but not widely going anywhere. But our main focus remains the NCR, where we have a very huge land bank. And since Gurgama is a success story now, so as what happens in future, whatever you make here, as long as they're compliant with laws and better than the best, market will pay for itself. So we don't have to rush around anywhere. If I were in my son's shoes, I would not rush around anywhere. Because you can more, more money. And we have seen with experience when you go to other states, politically, people, same attitudes, but here, we have developed relationship with 
authorities that we are known to be clean people. So why meddle around, go anywhere? Uh, and uh, just when you can make more money in this place here. Great. Now, what about the future? What are the plans that you see for the future for the group? Well, fortunately, in real estate, future is, for example, as much as you do here, but I keep telling my son on this thing, there's a need to diversify. Don't go to any other business. Real estate, the way we do it. We have expertise in shopping malls, good retail offices, good commercial offices, residential. World has got so much opportunity. You have no idea the amount of opportunity we have. So at this moment, organizationally, my son is homogenizing an organization because today you have to have a hard-hitting professional organization, which is, but he's hell-bent in improving them. When you have built a good organization here, then if I were him, now I'm not active, so therefore I can only advise, I would have gone outside abroad and done a wonderful job in the, because we, DLF can do it. When I see uh, Dubai, for example, the other day I was in Dubai, I say, oh my God, look at the building, why could they have not? But at that time we could not do, because we had, we had too many things happening in here. And if we had gone there, we had dissipated our energy, we would have failed in both. So whole idea is concentrate heavily in what you are succeeding. And build an organization to deal with future growth. And that organization should, in my view, be now concentrated in showcasing DLF's work abroad, elsewhere. You also give back a lot to society through CSR. We'll talk a little bit about that. Yes. You see, I've been quite trying to champion this issue. But unfortunately, I didn't succeed as much as I do wanted. But I, we do it as corporate because, you see, there, there's a concept I had. I tried um, 15, 20 years back, but it could not succeed in that manner. The concept is this, that every builder, developer and builder, now developers are, now every developer can be a builder, but every builder cannot be a developer. Because developers are supposed to be visionaries. So when you are a visionary, you make buildings and you have a contractor to construct a building. What happens then is you're disturbing, disturbing the ecosystem of the area around you. It depends the extent of your development. So I strongly believe that every developer and builder has one responsibility that whatever area you are developing, depend on the magnitude, say, say five kilometers around that, you must adopt it. Adopt means everything in adopting, whether it involves providing settlements to people, there's a village come in, you mean upgrading the village, provide all the facilities, schooling facility, all greenery, all environment, Everything concentrate heavily. And uh, now actually that is what CSR, CSR is supposed to be. So if imagine if, if let's say not all, but even 60, 70 percent, 60 percent of builders do this thing, India will be a different country. Because your whole area will get uplifted. So at least we do ourselves. Right? Our motto in CSR is frankly. That area around what we are doing, like for example, we noticed the government. You keep on telling they want be they want. For example, the highway you make it there are no overpasses, pedestrians. For example, so here in Gurgaon, for example, roads are made, but by the time pedestrian thing is made, it will be taken the five ten years. So we believe so we have made those great. Uh, sort of a crossing in this, so then 
Secondly, greenery around. The amount of emphasis we have on making the area green, then any schools, any village, of course, they're all villages to whose land we have taken. So go to the sea, improve the villages, schooling system, improve medical setup there. So it is a phenomenon of providing all related uh, sort of uh, services for a proper and adequate habitation. Of the area you are disturbed as a developer. It's a concept. This is what we are doing in CSR. So now just the last few couple of questions. This year the theme I'm understanding for the Entrepreneur of the Year Award is the Unstoppables. What in your mind has made you unstoppable over the years in the face of so much challenges and so much disruption? What makes you unstoppable? Well, if you see my life, it is an absolute classic question. It was every person whom I met with at the time of 75 when I got involved to 80 period. Frankly, when you see a mountain in front of you, laws are against you, unmountable. Then you, your banks do not give you money. If you can't get land, how do you create a city? Because See, the implication of a development of a city is so vital. Let me divert slightly because it's important thing for you guys to bring around also media. I believe that the creation of new cities and buildings can be the largest contributor to employment. Imagine in Gurgaon what has happened today. If I had not done it, what would have happened? Either it would have remained a desolate land or some kind of government um, society, some development would have happened, mostly unauthorized, and nothing would have happened. But by my doing it this action, which I said despite all odds. Superb. So what is the legacy that you want to leave? How would you like to be remembered? See, I want to leave a legacy of A, a person who has always conducted his life in the most ethical and moral values and always respected compliance of the laws of the land, however wrong the laws may be. But laws are laws. Okay. Number two. Other legacy is, while I've done so much, let's say for myself, for my company, for people who are there, is a win-win position. There's nobody lost. And my otherwise concept, whoever does business with me, we must be all benefit. This is my philosophy of life. That whoever associates with me, whether is a plot holder, my pricing has to be such that he eventually he makes money. Or a farmer whose land we acquired, they make money, or contractor or anybody, anybody who associates with you must not be a loser, must gain. If you do this position in letter and spirit, which I do, and fortunately my son also follows the same, then what happens is generally all round appreciation for the brand comes around. So my legacy would be, frankly, follow this spirit. And secondly, I, I regret not having been able to do as much as I should have done for the vulnerable section of society. So therefore, we are doing the CSR. I have made my own, uh, under my own name, a trust called K.P. Singh Charitable Trust. And we are just professionalizing just now, having a professional CEO with thing. And my plan is to fund it very strongly. In fact, when I'm no more, you'll find that this will be a very, very substantially rich foundation. So I want to create an organization to carry on the objectives. And what are the objectives? Is only to firstly identify those activities which are necessary for the welfare of the vulnerable section of society. At the moment, 
I don't want to say myself because I don't know enough. But once we set up this professional setup, advisory group, we'll identify. But we try to do those things. Mind you, this is like a drop in the ocean for India. But every drop matters. So my legacy would be to do something for those unfortunate people, which we could not do in one li lifetime. And do you have a role model? Have you ever had a role model? I would like to know that. Who is she or he? Well, to tell you on a role model, uh, in several aspects of my life, I would not call role model, but which have impacted me. Now, okay, let me tell you one, one or two people. So, I would not role model. Is difficult with a lot of items you don't agree press with the person, but uh, but some people have influenced me in my life quite a lot. One of them person was his name was H. G. Shodi. I wonder if you heard his name. He used to be there's a person called Arun Shodi, his father. He is no longer alive now. He was a very, very fine man. He he had started a thing called Common Cause. Now Common Cause was an organization which will take up subject of common thing. Was very experienced. So I had that much rapport with him that whenever I used to be in trouble, I used to go to him. Jack Welsh was another person, chairman of GE. I will call him quite a role model. And of course, a very big role model was George Hoddy, who trained me initially and who was chairman of uh, Universal Electric Company. So I had the great uh, uh, fortune of meeting people who became a great influencer of me. And I was a good learner from them, which I tried to put in my life. So can you share a life lesson that you have learned from your journey as an entrepreneur? Yes. Life lesson one is, in my view, one should never have a defeatist view. I, by nature, I don't look at the darkness of the cloud. I look at the silver lining. Every dark, every cloud, cloud to hoga. Dark to hai. Look, silver lining be hai na. This is a attitude. Like take for example, the another thing. My wife, when she had, late wife, she had cancer. It was small cell lung cancer. So all doctors, America, they said, well, data shows that not more than, not more than, 8% people live beyond two years. So Mr. Singh, no point of running around, go back home. So I said, no, I will beat the 8% odd. So would you believe I assembled a team of doctors and I became a doctor myself. I fought and she lived for 18 years. So by nature, I have an attitude that not to give in, but to be optimistic and fight for something. But for doing so, so other thing is I try to help people. I am a strong believer. Try and help, help, help. Because whatever you help, God helps you back. Motto of life. And of course, third philosophy is anybody who associates with you must be a win position. He must make money, profit or be happy. You should not have association with somebody who goes disappointed with you. So this is in turn. Superb. And last question, sir. What advice you would give to aspiring entrepreneurs? I'll give an advice just uh, firstly. You know, entrepreneurs means risk. What entrepreneur means taking it. You must take risk in your life. Even make mistakes. Make mistakes, but learn lessons from your mistakes so that you don't repeat them. India is a great country. My feeling is the amount of growth possibility which you have here is mind-boggling. Nowhere in the world. I've seen uh, France, England, everywhere. I now non-resident. I live outside. No way. India has a massive opportunity. So young entrepreneurs, the sky is the limit in India, but always be compliant to laws and ethical in your behavior. So my thing is, look positive, 
do whatever you can do in the business you are. Because just don't, a lot of people say, oh, chodo yaar, no koi fire. No. Be uh, positive because the sky is the limit of growth in India, frankly, if you do it well. Mr. K.P. Singh, thank you so much for everything. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Sushma. So if you could give us a sense of the size and the scale of the DLF as on date. Uh, size and scale of DLF, uh, let's see. Often people can do, like some people do market capitalization. In a real estate company, frankly, uh, my sense is very different but uh, one if you take a, 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 a size i think we have about 10 billion um, market cap 10 billion us dollar presently and uh, is growing so that is if one sense of judgment But this, the correct sense of judgment of a real estate company is the amount of land you own, which is zoned properly, which has been approved for you. That is your guts. Unlike in a manufacturing company, it's not the factory you own or machine you own. It's you have to produce every time you sell. Here, it is the most difficult thing is to get land which is zoned and according to rules and regulations of Gandhi. And in which success story started. If you develop some area which success story is not there, you will fail. So I would say, frankly, in DLF, the biggest th thing is we have got a huge land bank and potential land bank, which you will keep on. So it is a, uh, if you talk from market, market capitalization, I think it's about 10, 10 billion, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, something it was some time back and uh, we employ a large number of people mostly we do outsourcing but directly ro on the role we must be having 2500 i think but outsource maybe 25000 people because the beauty of this uh, real estate is you employ a lot of people so the in my sense of judgment if i was in government and that's why i'm trying to take up the issue give it this economy the highest priority you will find more employment because unskilled people get jobs in 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 construction and development because as you go in a skilled portion automation will take over computers are there so generation of employment will not happen that much there there people will start up their own but you have masses of in india who are not Uh, skilled and, and, and so for that the construction is the best activity and look at the kick, kick starting the industry I mean any const, uh, construction activity has effect on cement steel consumer durables and uh, every aspect of the economy paints this and that so once you have more buildings they start your excise revenue comes in more the GST is more So from every angle, this industry needs uh, sort of encouragement from the government. Right. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Singh. Thank you so much. Just for the record, tell us your name, designation and the name of the organization that you represent. Uh, my name is Rajiv Singh. I'm the chairman of DLF Limited. Mr. Singh, if you can tell us your first impression of Mr. K.P. Singh, so growing up first impression of him in business or him at work, if you can share any memories that you may have. Well, you know, I mean, um, fortunately, I was staying in Delhi all the time when my father was in business. Uh, he went through quite a difficult patch at the start of his business career coming from the army. Uh, I was fortunate. In fact, I personally believe the best learnings I got were sitting at the dining, uh, dining table, listening to him, uh, seeing him interact with his friends, sometimes dealing with issues and uh, crises. 
I think that was invaluable to me. So I always came to one conclusion that he never gave up. He always tried. And more importantly, he had a sense of fairness about him. Never, never, ever did I ever hear him, despite lots and lots of difficulty, uh, criticize anybody personally or mean any harm to any individual. I think those were the most important lessons and my impressions of him. So now, if you can give us a bit of a snapshot of his life and journey, as you know it from the time from when he came out of the army. Well, I wouldn't know, you know when he came out of the army and all because I was not around in those days. So, I mean, let me be frank about it. I, my first impressions, you know, I used to stay with my grandparents uh, till my grandmother passed away. So, you know, my initial impressions of him always were somebody who was a towering personality, um, a very outgoing and, and a, you know, very popular figure. Uh, somebody one would always sort of look forward to being with, even though one was a child, but still, I think he had that commanding aura around him where you wanted to be with him. Uh, as time went, I, I sort of started realizing the kind of struggle he had to put in to be successful in business, to, to meet the various challenges which came across. Those were difficult days, but uh, as I said earlier, he never compromised on his values. He never compromised on, on his view about people. He kept trying. Sometimes things worked out. Sometimes, unfortunately, they, they didn't. Um, but all through, uh, my impressions about him were, I mean, to be very frank with you, a very strong, powerful individual who never gave up, was helpful to all. And uh, as a child, as a son, I always felt I was in good, safe hands. I mean, that's as simple as that. So tell us the story of DLF and especially how Gurgaon came into being. Well, you know, <clears throat> since you're talking about anecdotes, I think uh, the simple fact is that uh, as far as story of DLF, I think my father would have already told you how it started with my grandfather and, and the entire story, so I don't want to necessarily repeat it. Uh, my father was basically, after he left the army, uh, he went into the manufacturing end of the, uh, the business. He had, of course, established a very successful uh, stud farm in the meantime, which was his personal passion. And, uh, you know, uh, but he really started off the hard way, literally established a factory from the ground up. And uh, the factory later on, I was also cut my teeth in business at the very same factory. Uh, it was a tough business. We used to make electric motors. Uh, good learning business to be in. Uh, and after that, later on, in the story of DLF and my father, I think you look, he decided, and possibly the right decision, painful as it was, that he had to make a choice between pursuing what was his baby at that time, which was a company called Willard India Limited. It used to make batteries. It had some technical issues, which despite my father's best efforts, unfortunately, were not being resolved. Uh, and he had to sort of take the hard call that, you know, you chop your limbs to save the body and hopefully your body grows strong enough without it. So that was the call when he took, I think it was in the late 70s. And uh, he moved into the real estate business. My grandfather at that time was <clears throat> sort of um, in advisory mentorship uh, mode. And uh, my father stepped in and I think benefited from all the advice and guidance he got, but provided the impetus and thrust which the business needed. And he took a great brand name, a great legacy, but infused it with new energy, uh, new opportunity, and, and touch what, that's what DLF is today. More importantly, I think uh, what he did was he brought in a sense of professionalism. He brought in a sense of maybe a new way of working into an industry which otherwise was maybe a little bit mom and pop type of um, industry. And um, he started with a very small parcel of land, which my grandfather had acquired on the outskirts of Delhi in a place called Gurgaon. Uh, we had no choice. We had to acquire it because Delhi at that moment in time was effectively not allowed for large scale uh, development. And uh, he took that patch of land and built it to what is Gurgaon today. Uh, he had to struggle. He had to convince people from all walks of life. 
to share his dream. He had a big dream, but uh, you know, as time goes by, politicians, bureaucrats, planners, even farm owners who had to sell him the land, finally the customers, I think everybody had to be carried along, had to be convinced. And I think that was the start of DLF. I mean, uh, my father's skill, I think, has always been that he has an ability to carry people. He is not only dreams big, but he manages to sell that dream and, and convince others about that dream and they sort of support him in that dream. And I think um, that was more than evident in the creation of Gurgaon and uh, DLF became synonymous with Gurgaon. And um, using that base, we successfully came back to Delhi, which was our hometown and uh, did quite well in Delhi. And I've taken this now to other parts of India and uh, hopefully re-establish DLF to the preeminence, which um, it deserved to be in the first place. So one of the toughest challenges while developing Gurugaon was, of course, which I think the fact that you held only about 30 acres or something like that, a very small parcel of land. How did he go about acquiring the remainder land? It was a huge amount of land and how much time did he take to do that? You know, really, I think the main success started with my grandfather, perfected by my father was actually we never acquired somebody's land. We actually made people a partner in the, in, in the progress and the development. So it wasn't a question of negotiating the right price. It was actually of selling the right dream. And everybody profited from that dream. So basically most of the farmers parted with their land willingly because either they were offered prices which were in excess of what the land was worth. More importantly, they were given an opportunity to participate by way of what is loosely called collaboration, which is a, a certain percentage of development land given back to them post development. So that way he not only got the goodwill of people, but uh, as I said, uh, uh, success begets success. Uh, he was very fair to everybody. So when he got the approvals after a fair degree of difficulty, everybody got their entitlements as promised. Uh, they all made money and I think it was their uncles, aunts and everybody else who rushed to, to participate in, in this opportunity. So I think it is really, as I said, creating an opportunity, convincing people of the opportunity and more importantly, delivering on that commitment. And I think from that process, the, uh, the business grew. As my father may have told you, capital in those days was tight. Bank financing was almost impossible. So the business had to be done on, on a pretty tight rope situation after you got the approvals within a few minutes or a few hours you had to kind of rotate the money and and carry on so it was a tough tough i think first seven eight years for him when uh, he had to carry through the cycle and i think once a capital base was created once again in the company uh, we could take a little different view and uh, and start buying land and, and building out for the long term what do you think about his greatest strengths you know as I said earlier, his greatest strength is, is people skills. Okay, I mean, he genuinely enjoys being with people. He genuinely enjoys interacting with people. He genuinely enjoys helping people. And I'm not talking about financial help. I'm any kind of help. If somebody goes to him with an issue, he loves to adopt it. He loves to give it his best. And he genuinely tries to help. It. And most like most of the time, he does succeed. That is, I, I think, his, his single biggest strength is that. Second, as I said, is that he's able to get people to 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 support his dream, support his vision. He, he carries people along, you know. Uh, in doing so, he leads from the front. Yeah. I mean, I, one thing is that he's not a guy who kind of advises others what to do. He, he, he does it himself yeah. and he's up there in front, but people follow. So, I mean, uh, that's, I think, his single biggest uh, success is his ability to motivate people, uh, put them into a united uh, sort of force and uh, provide them the leadership to achieve his and their goals. So I think uh, there's no question about it that uh, he's, he's an excellent people person. What do you think would be his legacy? As I said, look, he'll be remembered for his fair dealings, uh, for the help he gave to millions and millions of people uh, in all forms, whether it was in, in buying out the agricultural land, but in exchange for a fair profit, uh, whether in terms of giving people a home. Final legacy, in my opinion, would be he would be somebody who never ever 
let anybody down, uh, even if it was a commitment which he made in good faith and optimism, uh, and it didn't work out, he would give it his best. He struggled on a couple of old schemes, which I can say, which my grandfather had started uh, and ran into all kinds of problems. I think 20 or 25 years later, he delivered on those schemes. So uh, I think his real biggest legacy would be that, you know, he always came through, always kept up to his commitment. And I don't think you'd really, f I mean, I can't say in life, but you really find somebody who would say that he was unfair or cheated them. Give us a sense of the size and scale of DLF as it is today. Well, the size and scale of DLF today, we have two distinct businesses. We have our commercial rental businesses. We have a development business. Um, size and scale would be that uh, I think as of right now, uh, we are a listed company. Our um, stock market has um, rewarded us to whatever extent it, it feels appropriate. But our asset base, our biggest strength is that we have created a land bank, loose word, land reserve, which is in very, very important locations, which has a continuity of possibly today at full scale development, at least a couple of decades. Yeah. Uh, that is the real strength of DLF. We today have come back to doing about 10 million square feet of active development a year. Some of it is rented, some of it is sold. Wherever we have gone, we have established price leadership. We have established a new way of working. Uh, we generally go into markets and bring in the new ethical practices. It, in my opinion, revises the markets, revises the potential. So TLF's today's real strength is the deep base it has. We are generating good cash. We have a strong balance sheet. Um, I don't know how else to describe it. but. Give us a sense of the size and a scale of TLF as it is today, the market capitalization, turnover, anything, the number of people. Yeah, so basically market cap, we are in the double digits. I mean, it, it fluctuates, of course, but uh, uh, suffice to say it's about 10 billion plus today. I mean, God willing, would grow in uh, due course of time. More importantly, we're generating good cash. Number of employees, we've always kept our, our employee base a little tight. Uh, we outsource a lot of our work. So we are maybe close to just a shade under 3,000 odd people today in the company. But I think at least possibly 20 to 30 times that number would be employed by the company through various contracting arrangements, both in the construction side as well as in the operation and maintenance side. So collectively, I would like to believe that we are almost a five digit uh, uh, employer, but we keep our core operations lean. Any incident that you remember that has left a lasting impression on you by your father, which has characterized his personality and has left a lasting impression on you? Well, I think the, many of them are difficult to... to uh, but look, I think broadly I'll say he really comes through well at a time of crisis. He is, you know, an amazing, amazing crisis manager. And I've witnessed many, many crises which he has had to face, some in the business front, some in the personal front. Uh, so I think, you know, my mother unfortunately had a series of health issues, starting with a helicopter tragedy and then led on to other issues. I think those very, very difficult days, how he, he sort of got everybody together, how he gave leadership and strength to what many times was considered a hopeless effort. I think that in my opinion, is the lasting impression of him. I think when the chips are down, if somebody comes through, I think that's nothing more important than that. And I think uh, he became almost a doctor in that process and uh, continues to be always somebody I still believe, despite advanced age and everything else, if there's a crisis, I think he's the safest pair of hands to turn to. As a person, anything you can talk about on his personal side? Well, you know, hobbies are well known, his golf, his love for music, art, etc. But I think more importantly, you know, he, he's got a very, very, very strong personality. Um, you know, the immediate impression, maybe he's cold and aloof, but actually the truth is quite, uh, quite different. He's a very warm, caring person. You know, he's just, a, you know, he just comes across maybe first glance as that. But otherwise, he's, he's very, very, uh, um, he's a good listener. He, he's, he's a good learner. 
and always happy to help people. Loves to be with people. He's he's loves to surround himself, socialize with people of all ages, all types. So I think if you ask me what really is his his pride and joy is being with people and helping them out. Anything else that you would like to talk about that I am not aware of? Not really. I mean, I think um, I think you know it's very fair and fitting that what his recognition of his achievements have been done and nothing more i 